out on a limb. This is Spurn Head, a sand and shingle spit curling three and a half miles into the Humber estuary. For centuries, this lonely place has been home to communities of seafarers, soldiers and coast guards. In 1849, it was almost washed away. High spring tides made a breach half a mile wide and Spurn Point became an island with the North Sea racing through the gap. But it was needed as a natural breakwater and for military defence. So walls and barriers were built and access to the point secured. Now these old defences are crumbling before the waves and a new breach is imminent. Spurn could soon be washed away. Since Anglo-Saxon times, five headlands are known to have existed. In the year 670, there was a monastery here and in the 13th century, the town of Ravenser Odd returned two members to Parliament. Ravenser Odd now lies a mile out to sea. Unless millions of pounds are spent on sea defences, the lifeboat station, pilot tower and lighthouse on Spurn may be heading in the same direction. In the north of England, the east coast is badly affected by erosion. The worst takes its toll of Holderness in the old East Riding of Yorkshire. This is the flat land which stretches from the city of Hull to the North Sea. It's Europe's fastest eroding coast. Two metres of Holderness clay are washed away every year with the tides carrying debris south to form Spurn Head. There have been many lighthouses on Spurn, with the grandest, Smeaton's Highlight, first shining out in 1776. Spurn Point reaches into some of the most dangerous waters in Britain and the safety of shipping has always been the business of its community. Until recently, coast guards kept watch here and a lifeboat station was established as long ago as 1810. Since the turn of the century, the lifeboat has been launched over 1,500 times and saved the lives of around 700 people. It was a bustling community. Until the end of the last war, the people of Spurn had their own school. But now, the Coast Guards are gone. Smeaton's highlight and the lighthouse keeper's homes which surrounded it have been demolished. Only the lifeboat men and their families remain. They have moved nearer to the point. Where their former houses and the pub once stood, only the sea wall is left. The wooden barriers called groins that once protected the narrow strip of land are now all but useless and the road is frequently breached. Experts disagree about the evolution of Spurn. Until recently, it's been accepted that there have been several distinct peninsulas. The latest idea is that Spurn has constantly rolled westward with material washing over from the sea to the estuary. This natural process has been dangerously arrested by the building of sea defences and the military road. Since the dramatic breach of this road in 1991, the community on Spurn has held its breath. Beside this fragile tarmac strip lie the mud flats of the Humber estuary. If the new road succumbs to the tides, there's nowhere else to go. On this beach, we now have sand. And records suggest that that was never so. In the past, right back to maybe the 10th century, this was boulders and, and gravel. And the natural action of boulders and gravel in storm is to move upwards, onshore. So what we think happened was this, that during big storms, gravel would move up this beach and spill onto the other side, eroded from this side but accreting on the other. That was a natural way of things. But then, during the 18th and 19th centuries, they came along here onto this beach, and they took all that material, 
and put it into the holds of ships going out of Hull, which were coming in with cargoes and out empty. They filled up those ships with gravel from Spurn as ballast, and thereby took away all that marvellous material which was rolling over, and it was replaced with sand. And th therefore, the beach today is not as it should be, and there's a grave doubt if this beach can continue to do that rolling over which is so necessary to Spurn's future. We've held it against the natural forces, and I've described it as a coiled spring, and the tension point of that spring is just there. And if that tension point goes, then the whole spring will suddenly bounce landwards. A big storm can now peel that wall off, and the spring will suddenly lose its tension, bang, and we'll lose Spurn. So what have we got to do now to defend it? There are lots of people who just want it to stay as it is. Well, by staying as it is, what they're doing is they're, they're capitalising on a Victorian view of stability. They're only there because they thought it was stable. So we have a big problem. OK, if you say that people must be on the end, we have to do a compromise between what nature wants and what we want. And that compromise is very difficult to manage. It's not good enough to say on Spurn, let's do nothing. On the other hand, it's not good enough to say, let's surround it in concrete and encapsulate it. Let's make sure that we preserve the communities on the end and the road, and at the same time, let nature do its own thing. And that's very difficult. Spurn Point is home to the only permanently manned lifeboat in Britain. The eight crew members and their families live here, sharing the point with the Humber pilots in their control tower. At all times, they must stay within earshot of the alarm that signals a call out. They're all married and depend on their wives to do the shopping, ferry the children to and from school, and to take care of any business away from Spurn. If the road were to be lost, the wives and children would have to move away, leaving two crews of men taking turns to man the lifeboat on what would have become an island. For the last 10 years, I've been a full-time fisherman. I've been away for up to 20 weeks at a time. So now I'm actually living with my family. And if we lose that piece of land, then I have to go back to being away from home for a certain amount of time, and then back at home because they'll move the families off and just keep the crew. I was there when my two boys was born, and I never made another one of the birthdays until I was six. So in the two years I've now been at Spurn, I've spent more time with these three than I have the 10 years previous. So what are the negatives about it? From my point of view is not being able to go up the pub for a pint when you want to. You only get one day off a week, so you tend to play really hard in that one day. When it's on a day like today, you can't get a better place. But when it's cold, windy, raining, you're stuck in the house, you're not getting a call out, then it gets a little bit of a, a downer. But that's once in a blue moon, really. It's always something you can find to do. I don't think, other than the pilots and the Owen and Lai, anyone seems to put any real importance on the community and everything down here. It's not just a community. If you actually look at the job, what we do, ourselves and the pilots, 200 and odd shipping movements a day in this river. It's one of the most dangerous in the world, second biggest tides in the country, and all that is put aside for a, a site of special scientific interest. I understand that heritage and everything's big now, but there should be a sort of dividing line where you can have both. Well, I've got another 20 years left at Spain Point before I retire. And if you actually look at that tiny piece of land, that's all what dictates my future for the next 20 years. If we lose it, we lose everything what we've got down here. The cox of the Humber lifeboat is Brian Bevan, the most decorated serving lifeboat man in Britain. The Humber estuary is dangerous water, fast flowing currents, high tides, and some unusual hazards to shipping. The defense of the Humber in times of war has long been a serious matter. 
the Bull Sand Fort, was built and armed during the First World War and manned again in the second. Now, in peacetime, the river is as busy as it's ever been. The ports of Hull, Grimsby, Immingham and Goul are counting for hundreds of shipping movements every week. This lifeboat is only five years old and has already been called out 250 times, saving 40 lives. The usual fast thing in the centre here. We've got the safety clip. So should you fall in the sea, this side should operate automatically. to see, you know, something done about the road and keep us intact with the mainland. Do you think there's any danger that the road will be allowed to go? Well, it's been allowed to go now, isn't it? Nobody wants to pay or do anything for it. Any repairs are done at the moment are only paid for by ourselves, the RNLI and the Umber pilots. Nobody else is paying anything. They haven't bothered before, so I can't see them being interested now. The Yorkshire Wildlife lot. Well, they are interested, are they? They keep saying that they aren't bothered whether it becomes an island or not. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. They soon shout, I think. They shouted last time when the road breached last year and they couldn't get the cars on for two pound a time or whatever. They soon shouted then. We put a temporary road down and they couldn't wait to get it up to get the money off the cars again. The Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and the lifeboat men don't necessarily see eye to eye. Many lovers of Spurn and its wildlife would be quite content if the neck were breached and Spurn became a tranquil island refuge, an unspoilt natural environment. Spurn Head is owned by the Trust, who bought it from the Ministry of Defence for £1,500. It's a site of special scientific interest because of the richness and diversity of its plant and wildlife. When the Mamora's warbler made a recent unexpected landing on Spurn, the news went out on the telephone bird line and the place was invaded by twitchers. Serious bird watchers dismissed that sort of thing with a shrug. They've been counting birds of passage for almost 50 years, making Spurn one of the most important observatories in Britain. The moths of Spurn are the exclusive domain of resident warden Barry Spence. Each morning, he opens the lid of his moth trap with a sense of excitement. Over 600 species have been recorded here. Spurn specialities like the starwort and the brown line bright eye come here to feed on sand loving plants. Even rarities like the sea ermine and the scarce pug occasionally turn up. Apart from counting birds of passage, the main activity for the bird watchers is trapping and ringing. Since this observatory was established, enthusiasts like Ian Crowther have ringed over a quarter of a million birds. What sort of a bird is that? Willow warbler. Willow warbler? 
Yeah. 69 wing. And that's a, a migratory bird, is it? It certainly is. So where's it going? We're on its way to Africa shortly. It's a three. And what are you doing? You weigh it and measure it, do you? Yeah, weigh it and measure it, yeah. Age it. Thirteen point four. A fat one. A fat one. Is it an adult? No, it's a uh, bird of the year. <clears throat> so it's just hatched this year. Yes. There are various theories. Um, one theory says that the whole of the southern part would wash away and a new sperm would form further to the west. Another theory says that um, the breach will eventually fill in and uh, it'll just be a washover process and gradually move to the sort of roll over to further to the west. So where do you, where do you stand in this great debate? <laughs> well, my own personal feeling, and this is purely a personal view, is that um, if the breach is if a breach occurs, or when a breach occurs, rather than if, if nothing is done at all, eventually the whole of the southern part will wash away. That is my own personal view, but I'm, I'm not an expert. So right, according to your personal view, right down as far as the lighthouse and everything yes, would over go. a period of time, not, not straight away, obviously. It might could take several years to do that. But only several, not hundreds? Oh, no, only several, yes, I believe. That's my own personal feeling. A lot of the mudflats would remain, certainly to the north of the breach, so the... You know, a lot of the birds that feed on the mud flats would still have plenty of areas to feed on. Obviously, the interesting plants and insects would be lost on the sand dune area that would be washed away. So, do you accept the inevitability of that happening? If there's no, no money put in to do anything about sealing a breach, yes. And do you think if it does breach again, money will be put in? My own feeling is that money will suddenly appear and large amounts of work will then proceed. Fortunately, I haven't got too many years to retirement, so <laughs> hopefully it might last me out my working life. Eight, north, south. Well, I've just sat on the sea. I'll see. Any other ducks? Mallard? Shoveler? Blackshirt, tufted, scarp? One tufted, well... Has he added up all his swallows and that? Yeah. The only thing he has is Wimbrel, Kestrel and Sweat. Dunlin. Uh, one, four, eight, seven. Garment. Ten, so. Three on the Pine Beach off the car park. Who needs a new supermodel? They say you're so cute. like the way I look best, don't you? Time for your facial. The new supermodel. The Vauxhall Corsa. Chew Endercay after meals and snacks. New Spearmint Endercay with its special active ingredient helps keep the acid away that can start tooth decay. Anyway, I was in the post office when she comes in, picking up a HGV license application. Not for him with an articulate lorry. And the back of Mac and the sideboards. All I'll say is he was in the post office opening a joint national savings account Tuesday last. Ooh, I thought there'd never be more than one slice in his toaster. Don't look. Him on the 73. He was in for a bus pass and a look at the electoral register. 
I think we all know whose particulars he's been taking down. He never is. And then you, Nigel. He comes in the post office to get some photos enveloped. Fancy. Apparently, he's got one of those paranoid cameras. Special K low calorie breakfast. Get the taste, get the shape. Right now at Quick Fit, you can buy tires and exhaust at really low prices and not have to pay a penny until later. Can you afford to go anywhere else? Swinton Insurance has thousands of motor insurance experts, as I said. You're just like the weather forecast, said the wife. Wet with dull patches. <laughs> These are...